All right, welcome everyone. I have Evan Scribner McLean with me today. He's an instructor at Prominio Tech and a technical lead at Whoop. He has worked in a variety of industries, including e-commerce and biotechnology, and has a background in full stack web development. Evan has interviewed many candidates as a hiring manager and coached students through successful transitions into programming jobs. As a former bootcamp grad, he has been through the process of career change into software. Uh, welcome, Evan. Tell us how you got to be where you are right now, a technical lead at Whoop. Um, thank you. Thank you for the welcome. Um, yeah, I guess I can just kind of like uh, talk through my trajectory. Um, I've always kind of been interested in computers, but I, I didn't really have very much exposure to programming until college. Um, when I was in college, I took a couple computer science classes, but I elected to get a liberal arts degree instead. And a few years after that, I kind of found myself uh, interested in looking into software again for a couple of reasons. I wasn't really fulfilled with my job and um, I, I remembered enjoying programming. It seems like a good fit. So um, I kind of started a process of self-teaching and then I ended up in a, in a boot camp. Um, and uh, since then I've just been uh, like focusing on, uh, you know, getting, being the best software developer I can, I guess. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, that's kind yeah. of my path to where I am now. It does. So just to give people a little bit of context, you went to a boot camp. Mm -hmm. you successfully landed your first role in software development, and you had a couple of job changes since then on software, mm -hmm. uh, all kind of increasing, let's say, title, uh, mm -hmm. moving up the ladder. Is that yeah, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I've um, generally... Uh, I kind of have looked for opportunities to learn more like really quickly um, and uh, like places where I think uh, companies are willing to like take a bet on someone and, and give them a bunch of opportunity. And that, that tends to be what I'm interested in. And I think that's a important way to, to grow. Yeah. So tell me about what, what is it like to work as a technical lead? And tell us a little bit about Whoop as a company. What, what do you guys do? Yeah, sure. So uh, Whoop is a fitness wearable company uh, that makes a sensor that tracks biometric data. Uh, it has a kind of holistic picture of health that is oriented around uh, getting the most out of your performance. So that means instead of doing something like tracking steps, it is looking at your strain over the course of the whole day. And then it's looking at how your heart rate and respiratory rate change uh, to figure out whether you've recovered from your exercise and whether it's safe for you to exercise again. Um, so a technical lead, I think, is um, kind of like a team captain. So in addition to doing the same work um, day to day that a regular software engineer does, a technical lead is managing the team and working with product on kind of big picture initiatives like scoping upcoming work and defining the roadmap and, and vision for the team. Nice. Um on your LinkedIn profile and your resume, you I noticed you've done technical recruiting before. Yes. Yeah, uh, that was what I did before I, I did the boot camp and switched to software. Does that, it seems like two of your passions are the technical work and also the recruiting component. Is that accurate? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I kind of, sometimes I feel weird about that because a lot of people really find the hiring process like very difficult and, um, you know, kind of miserable for some people. I happen to enjoy it a lot. Um, and I think that uh, it could be done a lot better at a lot of places. But yeah, I, I would say it's something that I, I kind of enjoy learning about and, and helping other people kind of navigate through. Yeah, so that's the main reason I really wanted to talk to you today is for to get some of that knowledge out of your head. You shared with me that you've done between somewhere between 300 and 400 interviews. Is that right? Yeah, I've, I've worked for uh, several companies that are hiring really aggressively. And in the past, I've, I've also uh, done contract work to interview um, on behalf of other companies. Mm -hmm. So in that time, um, as an individual contributor and as a contractor and now as a hiring manager, I've done a lot of interviews, a lot of technical interviews. So mm -hmm. I think I have some things to say about it. I hope I can provide some, some valuable perspective. Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about interview preparation. Mm -hmm. what, what are some things that candidates commonly miss or forget to do during the preparation stage? Uh, that's a good question. So um, I think one of the things uh, 
there's a couple different things I think candidates can miss. Um, at a very high level, um, there's some things that I'll say, um, maybe these might sound obvious, but I see candidates miss them all the time. So I think it's worth kind of talking about. Um, mm -hmm. Doing research about the company that you're applying for is very valuable and indicating that and, and asking questions about it um, shows the hiring manager that you're distinctly interested in this company, um, which is something that is, is valuable and it can kind of uh, make the match go better. Um, for example, uh, a lot of companies have engineering blogs or just blogs in general, and they'll talk about big projects that they're working on. They might talk about um, the way that their engineering culture works and what's, what's valuable to them. So uh, doing that research and then showing the company that you, you learned about that is, is very useful. Um, in terms of more technical things, um, one of the things that I see a lot of people not be prepared for in technical interviews is um, they will not use the programming language that they're most comfortable with. So they might have somebody say, Python is a good interview language, you should use Python, or they might learn that the company exclusively uses Java, so they'll use Java or whatever other reason. And I, in my opinion, that's almost always the wrong decision. Um, even if your language is one that the company completely never uses, the way that you can like best express yourself with code is the best way to uh, come into a technical interview, I think. So give, maybe give us an example for Whoop. I assume you've been interviewing candidates for Whoop. Is that right? Yeah. And what's what tech stack are you interviewing for on your team, at least? Yeah. So for me, um, so regarding the language thing, I, I always encourage candidates to uh, focus on an area that they're most comfortable with. So uh, my team is cross-functional. So we're hiring front-end, back-end, and both mobile stacks, um, which is kind of a interesting challenge to interview for because um, I'm not a mobile developer. So it's it's a whole kind of new thing to learn. Mm -hmm. I obviously uh, rely on our mobile developers that we have at the company to, for the technical expertise there. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, so I, I would encourage a candidate to kind of um, demonstrate their, uh, their areas of strength. And um, in terms of our technical interview, I would like to think that our interviews are fairly pragmatic. Um, they're not um, kind of arcane algorithm questions. We, we ask people to uh, solve practical problems that are sort of reasonably scoped to the, the size of like an hour interview, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, and are, in, your, in your case, are you mostly doing uh, live challenges, not, not nothing take home? Um, so for my current role, I, I almost exclusively do the, the behavioral interviews and they're, they're, those are all live. Mm -hmm. um, and we do, uh, I think we do take homes for some roles, but typically most of the interviewing is, is live challenges. Mm -hmm. It's sort of an interesting um, thing to think about as a hiring manager and deciding what to do, because um, you're trying to balance interviews that are like fair and give good signal um, with your own time and with the candidate's time. So giving somebody a 20 hour take home project and then reviewing it is probably a really good way to figure out how they'd be to work with, but no candidate wants to do that. I wouldn't want to do that as a candidate. And as a hiring manager, I don't want to review that, uh, you know, for every applicant that we get. So mm -hmm. we have to kind of make, I see, you know, a lot of people online are really don't like algorithm interviews or like coding interviews. There, there's a lot of people who uh, I think kind of rightly, like, don't see that as a perfect way to assess somebody's ability to perform in a software job. Um, but I can understand how a lot of companies end up on that because it is a reasonably empirical way to assess someone that is like fair, like everybody gets the same question and it's, it's time efficient. Um, so yeah, it's, that's kind of a, like a challenging thing to, to sort of navigate. Mm -hmm. So I think that these um, like practical questions are uh, really good. Um, but one of the problems is that um, like a lot of companies want to hire somebody in a, in a like framework agnostic way. So if your company uses React and somebody knows Angular, you know, I don't care. I want to see, you know, if you learned one JavaScript framework, you can probably learn another one. Um, but if I just have a React interview, that could be a qualified candidate that I miss out on. Mm -hmm. But having that React interview means I'm, it's a much more pragmatic interview versus like a leak code style, like algorithm interview. So right. I don't know, that's something I kind of like think about a lot because I'm trying to find like a, like a better way. It's a process I always want to be improving. So let's say you've got a bootcamp grad from, mm -hmm. from Ineo. They're nearing graduation or they've just graduated and they are searching for a job and they come to you and they say, 
how should I be spending my time to prepare for this? What would you say? Would you direct yeah. them to leak code stuff? What would you say? So I think there's probably um, like a variety of different types of interviews. So one of the first things I would probably ask is, where do you want to work? Um, so if somebody is very interested in working at like a large tech company with thousands of employees that's in a technology industry, those companies overwhelmingly ask like leak code style questions. And if somebody is like very interested in working at that kind of company, that's probably what they should be focusing their energy on. Um, I think smaller companies tend to ask more practical questions, but it, there's a lot of variation. Some companies give take homes. Mm -hmm. um, so I would encourage somebody to kind of do a mix. I think leak codes are valuable, especially for new programmers, even if, and I know a lot of people feel this way, you don't think it is a accurate uh, demonstration of what the process of making software is like. It is uh, pretty good at making somebody better at programming. You learn other tools that your programming language has. You learn what a, what a set is or you know how to use a hash map. These things can come up occasionally and it mm -hmm. just makes you better at the tool that you're using. So um, when I've had students in the past, I encourage them to just do like one leak code a day and kind of just make it like a, you know, doing like a rep, just like get, get slowly better at them. Mm -hmm. um, and then practicing other aspects of interviewing. So prior to the pandemic, one of the things I encouraged was practicing uh, writing code on a whiteboard because that is very common in programming interviews, but not anymore. Mm -hmm. um, very few in-person interviews happening these days. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it'll ever go back to in-person interviews? I think that's probably going to be one of the last things that, that changes because, um, you know, in terms of like companies feeling comfortable having people in person, like a totally unvetted person that you're interviewing is uh, probably, you know, I think that'll be sort of the last thing that changes. Mm -hmm. as uh, people get more more comfortable, but who, who knows? I, I want to jump back to the question about what are some things candidates missing or that mm -hmm. may be missing during interview prep and expand on that question. Are there some things that candidates did that really impressed you around company research that stick out in your mind? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely it is good to uh, kind of look into a company. Um, I like it when people have like read the engineering blog and they talk about challenges that we've had recently. That, that impresses me. It shows me that somebody has a distinct interest in the company mm -hmm. um, and uh, that they're like, it's not even like, just to be totally candid, like it's always nice that somebody is enthusiastic about the company, but you, you don't need somebody who's like crazy about it. I know most people are just interested in a job but when somebody's done research that indicates to me like how they conduct themselves in that kind of conversation, that they're like proactive and that they're, they're like know how to communicate and how to like make that kind of impression. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, when I see that somebody is like, has learned about the company, uh, that's telling me things about how they communicate and how they're going to like interact with other people when they work here. So if that makes sense, like that's, that's why those kind of things impress me. Yeah. Um, so I think that's good. And I especially like it when it, when it's technical, when somebody says like, I noticed that you had this problem that you, you talked about in your blog. I thought that was interesting. Like, here's a similar thing that I've worked on. Mm -hmm. um, and um, with, with Whoop particularly, Whoop has a really, really strong engineering culture that has a lot of very, very highly opinionated beliefs about the right way to make software. Um, and we've, we've posted about it online a fair amount. So when people have read that and they share their thoughts on it, that's always, uh, that's always nice to see. What about other, I like the engineering blogs. I've noticed that a lot of companies do have that. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes have suspected for some companies, a big motivation for them writing those engineering blogs is for their talent pool mm -hmm. to, is that, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, it's definitely a way to uh, kind of show people what is going on at the company, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, a lot of people can see the outward facing part of the company, but an engineering blog is a great way to give a prospective engineering candidate, like a kind of closer look at what the day-to-day -day is like um, about, and like show the stuff that you're working on and like interesting problems. So, yeah. What about, what about other areas other than engineering blogs? Have you seen any situations where candidates research maybe on GitHub to see if the company has anything up on GitHub or if they have any consumable APIs out there? Yeah, that's always a, a great one. If a company has open source projects that you can, you know, best case contribute to, or at least be familiar with, or if you can 
build something with one of their APIs, that's always a great thing to kind of like show your, show your passion. Mm -hmm. I think that would go very far for a candidate. Obviously, yeah. you know, for, from the, I'm speaking from the perspective of a hiring manager with the candidates coming in. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit different from the perspective of a job seeker because they're trying to use their time efficiently. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of decide in like a quality over quantity question about where you want to invest your time. Mm -hmm. I think the right thing is in the middle with a bias towards quality. Mm -hmm. um, you shouldn't spend 40 hours prepping for one company and become obsessed with it. You're setting yourself up for a lot of disappointment. Mm -hmm. But you also shouldn't be sending out hundreds of applications a day. Um, okay. So I, I think that uh, the right way to do your job hunt is to kind of like um, find that balance and find where like the right amount of research to do for one company is, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think one question that a lot of students have is where do you even find these companies? For example, you were at Wayfair previously, right? And now yeah. you're at Whoop. How did you find out about Whoop? Most people probably listening have never heard of Whoop. Yeah. Um, so I have a fairly strong opinion about this that might be somewhat controversial, but I tell my students to not apply for jobs uh, online on online job portals. Mm -hmm. I personally have never got a job that I applied for online. Mm -hmm. um, all of my jobs have either been through me being contacted or through uh, intentional networking. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's a, a little bit tangential to your question, but sort of talking about the like kind of discovery uh, portion of it. Mm -hmm. um, I only, you know, when, when I have been looking for jobs, I've only used job boards as a way to find companies, but then I don't go there. I go and try to contact somebody from the company or uh, learn more about it. And that's when I kind of start like a research process. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of finding companies, um, so uh, job boards are one way. You know, obviously you can search on, on LinkedIn and Indeed. Um, I've had a lot of success uh, with a student I'm working with right now is, is um, uh, someone I've worked with in the past who's looking to change jobs. And she's not really sure where to apply. So she actually had this problem uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we started looking at industry specific job boards. So you can get kind of more narrow. Um, so for example, there are several remote specific job boards for people who are very interested in working a remote job and that's a hard requirement for them. Mm -hmm. um, you can find companies that are completely remote that are you know, very friendly to that where that won't be a barrier to career advancement or something. Mm -hmm. um, there's a company called Built In that has uh, like sites for each like major uh, metropolitan area, at least in the US, there's like built in Boston, built in New York. Um, and that those tend to be tech industry jobs. So somebody who wants to work for like a tech company and that's kind of the industry they're interested in, mm -hmm. uh, that's a good place to kind of start that process. Um, and then obviously this is um, more applicable to somebody who's already working in a tech job, but uh, networking is a great way to do that. Uh, finding somebody you know who already works at the company is a great way to get your foot in the door. It's also a great way to find out how things are in the inside. So you don't get surprised after you join that the, the culture is not what you thought it would be. Uh, so. Talk about, can you talk a little more about intentional networking? Yeah. Um, so what I, I suggest to my students, which um, some people are a little bit squeamish about because of, uh, you know, being an introvert is to just cold DM people um, mm -hmm. and ask them about the company. I, I think this is a good strategy to get your foot in the door. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, something that like when I was younger, I felt like networking was very kind of fake and like artificial. And as I've gotten older and more experienced, I've realized there, there isn't really like a boundary between like you can do something in like a sort of, uh, I guess like self-interested way that mm -hmm. isn't like fake. You can be legitimately friendly and legitimately like interested in learning in a company and just ask those questions. It, you don't have to be like putting on a mask, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And the same goes, I think for all networking, like just meeting somebody and making a connection with them on a professional level, isn't just like fake, like you can actually help that person or they can help you. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, like one of the things that got me over the anxiety about the cold DMing was uh, recognizing that networking is like a, actually like empathetic and like helpful thing. It is not just like a phony, like careerist thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, my, my typical uh, approach is to uh, learn about the company and then write like a particular company specific message that is, is written in such a way that the person can tell that you are not copy pasting a message to many companies. You 
have a couple sentences in there that show that you're writing it to them about their company. And then ask questions about things that you're legitimately curious about. Um, try to start a conversation, um, you know, ask people if they want to get coffee or if they want to call. Um, and then, um, you know, I would, uh, I would encourage students to either do this to a software engineer or to a recruiter. And if it's a software engineer, you can just, you know, once you've established a rapport with the person and, and you feel like you're interested in the job, you could ask them to refer you. A lot of people are very receptive to that. Um, it's, it, myself, I went through a boot camp. I had to do all this. So this happens to me all the time, probably like two or three times a week. Somebody will send me a message like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am receptive to that because I, I went through that and I'm empathetic to what it is like to be doing that search. And, you know, a lot of those people aren't like the right match for me, but I, I always want to try to respond to them and, and give them advice if I can. So I've had my students uh, dedicate time to that in the past mm -hmm. as part of their, uh, we usually come up with like a sort of daily checklist for job search or sort of just interview preparation in general. So it starts with like a leak code and then it's like, do like five DMs on LinkedIn and that's make those like more qualitative. Um, and then, you know, some other parts of the process depending on the student. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, I have a lot of follow-up questions to that. Okay. Um, so you're getting a lot of inbound DMs on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so because of that volume, you probably have some insights on how to craft good cold DMs, I would assume. Yeah, I think so. What are, um, what, what are some things that stick out in your mind that, I mean, you're busy, you've got a lot going on. You can't respond, you can't go in detail with all these, right? Yeah, I, I can't. And that kind of makes me sad sometimes because I, I would really like to help everyone who messages to me, but it's, uh, it's not mm -hmm. possible. It's just a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, um, you know, obviously be, be friendly and professional. Um, similar to in an interview, like if you, if you can indicate that you're specifically interested in a company, that makes me a lot more likely to respond. Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody tells me, Hey, I'm interested in your company or even better, like your team, because of these reasons that, that makes me, uh, very interested in engaging with that person. Um, and also I would say, just be, be forward about it. Uh, let the person know like, hi, I'm interested because I'm, I'm looking for a job. You know, I don't think there's any reason to beat around the bush about that. I, I think sometimes people are kind of. They want to be coy about it so they're not like you know rude but everyone knows what linkedin is for and yeah I, I think it's good to just kind of establish like a relationship with like friendly candor i think is like a good good way to conduct yourself in that kind of situation mm -hmm. um so yeah that that's what i would say are, are the the big things mm -hmm. um yeah um tell me a little bit more i know that when you were um when we spoke first at length, it was me interviewing you to teach at Prominio. Yeah. And one of the things you talked about a lot was aside from your day job, you work with students who are looking mm -hmm. to get jobs. Uh, yes. I'd love to hear, tell me more like where that's going and how that's, what, what does that look like? How many students and how do you engage with them? Where do you find them? What does that look like? Yeah. So, um, this is something uh, I kind of do mostly out of like personal passion. I really just enjoy teaching. And I, you know, as we've been talking about, I kind of enjoy uh, mentoring people about the hiring process. Um, so in the past, I've had like two or three students at the same time, but now it's just like usually two at the same time. I, I have several students who've gone on to get jobs. So I still kind of like mentor and help them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not a, uh, it's kind of, like uh, something that I've done mostly through people that I know and then people that they know, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. It's, it's ne never been like a sort of full, yeah. uh, like side business or something like that. So you're um, still, I, I, so it's still just a handful of people, word of mouth. You're not yeah. you have a website, you're not marketing for it or anything. No, and uh, I'm not really interested in, in building that out more at the moment, at least um, because takes a, like, I, I really get a lot out of it. It's, it's really nice to have that much like one-on-one -on -one time with an individual person. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it isn't really scalable from like a, like a business point of view as much as I would like to do that. So, uh, mm -hmm. one of the reasons I was interested in a, a bootcamp instructor job is because it kind of scratches the same itch for me, but it's, uh, you know, you can kind of reach more people and it's, it's more, more sustainable mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh, talk about if you could, let's go to the behavioral interview. Cause you said you're doing a lot of behavioral interviews now. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, what are some of your favorite questions to ask? Um, well, uh, one of them that I have been enjoying a lot uh, recently is um, I try to kind of give people like slight curveball questions. Like I don't want to make somebody uncomfortable or like, you know, make the interview like overly challenging, but I would also like to like get away from a canned answer. I want to get somebody off their script because I'm trying to, the point of the interview is for me to figure out like what they would be like to work like work, work with. And uh, hearing a recited script isn't, isn't very helpful for that. Although I understand why people do it. I, I, I get it. Um, so um, one question I've been asking for like uh, people who have already worked in engineering jobs is like, uh, tell me about how your product manager would talk about you. Um, and I, I like that because it, um, ask the candidate to demonstrate some like empathy for like another person's role and uh, show that they understand like what the different responsibilities and incentives are in an engineering organization and how the needs of product are different than the needs of engineering. And then they get to talk about themselves and how they can attend to that. Um, so uh, that's, that's one of the reasons I, I like that question. Um, I also, another question I've, I've enjoyed asking is, uh, Tell me about a time you had to convince someone else of something when they were wrong. Um, there's like a trap in that question, which is like it can, you know, reveal that you're a very difficult person if you answer it the wrong way. But if you don't fall for the trap, I think it also gives people a lot of opportunity to talk about their communication and, and kind of like the way that they think about collaboration and disagreement and those kind of things. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. What? Talk a little bit more about the trap. So people are probably very interested. They want to know more about the trap, I would say. Yeah, no, well, okay. So, I mean, in my current role, we, we have really great recruiters. And, and usually by the time somebody gets to me, they're, they're very personable. I, I don't often see a lot of like major red flags in the behavioral interview. But uh, somebody can definitely answer a question like that with very little empathy and, and a lot of like kind of self-certainty and stubbornness. It's not the that's the whole point of the behavioral interview is that we we don't want to work with people like that. Um, one of the uh, I know uh, Amazon has a a phrase disagree and commit. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, that is uh, kind of an attitude of like vigorously debate something and then like at the end of the day like we can't just argue forever. We have to pick one thing and then we're all in on it. Um, and that's an attitude I like to see of somebody who is not afraid to speak their mind and is going to back that up with evidence and really try to make a case and then at the end of the day be willing to go all in on something that is not what they think the best the best choice is that's a, that's a really good collaborator that's the kind of person you want on your team so does that make sense yeah. yeah yeah not everything about you know amazon is 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 crazy i think that that uh that attitude is a, is a good good philosophy to have on like uh those kind of conflicts yeah what is what is your suggestion for people to prepare for behavioral interviews? Mm. I have a, a methodology for this. Um, it is uh, mostly inspired by a passage in the book Cracking the Coding Interview, although I, I have some of my own suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a while since I've read the book, and I've told a lot of students about this, and I've added my own things in. So. I don't quite remember where the part that I got from the book ends and my own suggestions begin. So I just want to add that disclaimer that I'm not sure. plagiarizing the book. I'm just not sure it's what's inspired, from where. inspired by cracking the coding. Interview. Yeah. Um, but what uh, she wrote about in the book was um, taking like five or so stories from your, you know, ideally from a previous job or, you know, if you're a student then from, from school um, and uh, that you think are really good examples to talk about. And then kind of like doing a matrix where you have like each story and then for each story, you can kind of like identify like what was a big success, what was a big failure, what was a conflict or like a challenge, like think about those things. Um, and then uh, what I've had students do is like, you can go if you search like behavioral questions online, you can find a list of like top hundred behavioral questions. And if you read them, you realize there's, you can kind of start kind of categorizing these. There's only so many different like angles and mm -hmm. so you you have your list of like stories and you look at each question and you're like how could i spin this story to answer that question um and you 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 go through and you like oh, i don't really have a good story that talks about like a conflict with another person i have to fill that in and once you've kind of gone through it you can have a repertoire of stories that you are practiced in telling that 
uh, satisfy like a lot of common behavioral questions, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. So that that's a that's a technique uh, that I've suggested um, to people. Um, and then uh, another thing that I think is important is uh, getting comfortable in that kind of scenario. So this is something I have to remind myself of personally when I'm talking to students because I'm extremely extroverted. And on top of that, I'm a person who, when I get anxious, it makes me really friendly. And like, I smile and become really talkative. So I like do really well in interviews because like, that's just how my, my personality works. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, a lot of people are not like that. And, and I, recall, that like, I recall that when I interviewed you, was yeah. that because you were nervous? Um, I mean, I'm always a little nervous for an interview. I don't, I don't think I was like petrified, but I, I tend to just be like kind of high energy when I'm in that kind of situation. Okay. Um, yeah. And um, not everyone's like that. That's totally fine. But I, I think that, you know, it's important uh, in general in your career, you know, especially in software to kind of like be identifying areas where like you can, you need to practice and you can improve. So, you know, I would, I would say, you know, practicing public speaking, practicing talking about your, yourself, uh, you know, doing mock interviews and putting yourself in that kind of situation can, can really help a lot. Uh, it definitely shouldn't be the first time that you've told a story and you should definitely be comfortable enough with it that it doesn't sound like scripted, that you can just kind of talk and, and make it sound organic. So, mm -hmm. um, you so, know, uh, so boot camps, a, go ahead. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think, I think you're going to say the same thing as me, but boot camps are a great place for that because you can find another person to practice with because you're, you're surrounded by people who are interested in the same thing mm -hmm. that you are. Find a free, yeah, I was going to say, find a friend, ask a friend to ask you these questions. You can practice it. You can write your answers out. It's not a bad idea to write mm -hmm. your answers, I would say. Yeah. Uh, but you don't, you, maybe you're writing it to help refine your story. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't necessarily want to read it when you're answering it because you always might want to tailor it to the situation. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, it's, you should get like comfortable with kind of speaking naturally, you know? So I, I've actually, when I've done this, I've avoided writing them in a way that is um, like made to be spoken. Like I, I write like bullet points because I can't, like it, I, I don't have a fallback to start reciting if I become confused about what I should say next. So that there's no kind of like mental like thing you can resort to. So you intentionally write it as a bullet so that you avoid going into sound very uh, yeah, sound yeah. very robotic yeah okay. um that's a good so, that's a great technique i like it yeah i I've, i like that for any kind of like uh like prepared thing i personally i'm just i'm somebody who speaks a lot more um naturally when i don't have a script and mm -hmm. uh so generally like when i do like a big presentation at work or anything like that i i tend to just have notes i think that that's probably just me i'm not sure if everyone mm -hmm. feels that way but i, I don't like uh writing something down and, and remembering it it doesn't ever come out right for me i need mm -hmm. to sound like i'm talking um on this note the the collaboration with another person thing is i think also a good technique for programming interviews um in addition to doing things like practicing leak codes um you should get like comfortable writing code in front of another person live and talking about it while you're writing it uh you know that's something that if you've been studying really hard for months you still might not have ever done before and uh, it's an important thing to get used to. Uh, it can tell tell us why that's important to get used to. Is it important uh, beyond the interview? It can be, yeah. It depends on the company culture, but it, I think it's uh, always important to be able to express your thoughts uh, about code. And mm -hmm. in a lot of companies, there, there is a lot of collaboration and you're, you're going to be programming with people, you know, mm -hmm. on during the job. So, and uh, on like a like kind of less ideal note of, things that are only relevant for the interview. Some companies don't allow you to search the internet when you interview. I don't think that's really realistic at all. It never made sense to me because like you search the internet constantly on the job. Um, I would rather watch somebody search the internet and actually see how they do it. That'd tell me a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, probably something worth practicing is like uh, if you're used to double checking syntax and you're preparing for a very tough programming interview, put yourself in an environment where you don't have access to that and see like, oh, I actually forget. Can I access strings like arrays? Like how do I access a certain character in a string? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, those kind of things that might come up in an interview. You're just like, oh, I, I actually don't know that. So mm -hmm. it's good to kind of check yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, are, what are some other common things that come up in interviews that you would like to share with students? 
Uh, so like, what do you mean? Like, just like generally like tips or, or like what? Gen general, general tips. I mean, you've done, I'm just trying to extract more of maybe the patterns that you've seen. I assume you've seen a lot of different patterns. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say so. Um, so, um, I guess if you want, we can talk a little bit about the, the technical side of things, but mm -hmm. I, I think, um, some of this is also applicable to behavioral. So I'll talk about the widely applicable things. When okay. you're asked a question, technical or behavioral, I think it's really important if you want to excel and do really well to have a, like a systematic approach to answering a question um, that is like, um, so actually it is kind of similar for both behavioral and, and technical questions, but for like a behavioral question, um, you typically, uh, there's like different acronyms that in like heuristics people use to remember this, but the, the general idea is that you typically want to describe what you're going to talk about at a high level and kind of like give context for it. And then uh, like drive through the story with a very uh, like steady pacing. So I can't remember if this is from Cracking the Coding Interview or somewhere else, but there, one of the acronyms is STAR, uh, which is Situation, Thesis, Action, Result. Uh, so you describe the situation and then say, this is what I'm going to talk about. You know, here's what we did. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that's a good kind of way to be systematic. Um, I have a couple like really structured techniques for programming interviews, but generally if you get asked a programming question, like you should be organized. I think I see candidates who I think have the ability but like kind of go down the wrong path when they don't have that organized approach and they just start writing code immediately. And then they're like doing something kind of wrong and they like go way too far down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. um, a candidate who's going to start off by really clarifying the question, writing some examples, being like, okay, so if I had this input, we want this, right? And then for this input, it would return this. And then once they really have a, and then those examples, you know, if you really want extra credit, you can write those as test cases before mm -hmm. you actually write the algorithm. Then describing their approach, maybe like just commenting without writing any code. And then once that's really settled, then they start implementing it. And then the implementation just comes naturally because they've already kind of figured all the, all the parts out. Mm -hmm. Those, uh, those tend to be the candidates who, who really excel. And I think that they have a practiced technique and a practice system for, for handling those kind of questions. I have a feeling that when you're interviewing someone, if they follow that method right at the beginning, you must have a sense internally like they're going to do well? Yeah, typically, I mean, like I try to keep an open mind through the entire interview, but mm -hmm. um, I would say you usually have a good indication of how somebody's going to do because of how they like approach something. It, it shows how much they've been practicing and it, you know, it shows how comfortable they are with the situation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I was wondering, I thought maybe on the fly, it might be fun to sort of walk through a common question and what what that would look like. Sure. If you want like, me to answer an algorithm question, I can. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I can. Okay, so I think um, one of the most common algorithm. Uh, so I guess what what level should we discuss? Uh, like a associate level, like junior, like the, the most basic level. I was thinking like a fizzbuzz kind of question. Okay, let's go with uh, like reverse the string. Okay. Um, or actually, uh, slightly similar, but. Uh, Determine if a string is a palindrome is, is another very common one. Sure. Um, yeah. So uh, do you just kind of like walking through that approach, is that what you mean? Yeah, if, if, if you were presented with the question, hey, yeah. uh, reverse this, is this a palindrome, return, yeah. you know, true or false? Return true or false, right. What, what, would, what would be, how would you walk through that one? Yeah, so uh, I would start off by asking clarifying questions. I, I know what a palindrome is, but I want to make sure that the interview and I have the same definition. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so in this type of interview question uh, is a common type for algorithm style interviews is you're, you're being asked to write a function that does something. Mm -hmm. um, so I would typically, my general advice is like, do not immediately start typing code. Um, but an exception to that would be like, if you're being asked to write a function, write the function signature. Mm -hmm. So, and then you have specified like how many arguments it has and depending on the language, like what their types are and what it returns. Um, and then once you have that, you start asking clarifying questions and examples, and you can write those examples as test cases. So I would, without having written any of the function yet, I wouldn't call it 
and say, so if we called it with this, we would expect the results to be this, right? And then, and then write several of those. So then you, now you have a unit test suite that you're doing test-driven development. You haven't even like started talking about the algorithm yet. And you already have this like really organized like uh, template to, to write in. And you've mm -hmm. also at the same time um, asked about all the edge cases and your interviewer is going to like to see that like, oh yeah, they're like, what if I get a null input? You know, what about so if- you uh, might, So you might, if it was a palindrome, you might say, is it case sensitive? Yep, yep. Or like, do we care about spaces or like, you know, what if it's what an if, empty string? What if there's numbers there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. What if there's characters, um, characters. Yeah. So then, and then for each one of those questions, you can write a test case uh, that you, you were printing out. Um, and, and then just in, case, just in case someone listening doesn't know what a palindrome is, can you explain yeah. what a palindrome is? Oh yeah. So a, a palindrome is just the, the, a sequence that is the same backwards and forwards, like the word radar or, or taco cat or something. Or um, race car, I think is another one. Yeah. Race car. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, after you've done that, I would say still don't write any code. So that there's a lot of uh, discussion before you write code. I would then say, talk through what you're going to do. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, for this one, you know, I would say just compare it to like string dot reverse. Like the string well, string dot reverse is the easy obvious thing. Interviewer mm -hmm. might say uh, points for that, but you actually have to, you know, use a loop or something. It depends on the interview. Maybe they would be happy with that solution. Mm -hmm. um, but I would I would talk through that. So I'd say, okay, we're not going to use reverse. I'm going to use a for loop, and I'm going to iterate and then compare it to the uh, like the complement index. So if we're at zero, I'll do like length minus one minus zero mm -hmm. for it. So, um, and then, you know, you describe your whole strategy in detail and then I, and maybe uh, depending on how complex the question is, you're like writing comments for each part of the, the function. Mm -hmm. And then, then I would implement it. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, as I implement, um, again, depending on the complexity, I would run my code incrementally uh, using console statements or, or print statements to like verify things kind of as I go. Um, I think that's good for a couple of reasons. Um, it can catch things early that can lead you to a really bad place if you don't catch them. Like some, it, hard for me to think of a particular example without getting like really in the weeds, but like sometimes you can have a misconception about the data structure that leads you to write a lot of code that just doesn't work at all. And mm -hmm. if you're kind of incrementally like running the program, you catch that very early. Sometimes you can write a bug that if you catch right away, it'll be like, oh yeah, I know what I did wrong. But if you haven't looked at that code in 20 minutes, it's gonna take you longer to figure that out. So I think that's another good reason. And I think it just shows uh, like a very organized approach to the question. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it is a good idea to try to look like a, like a wizard and just like type it all out and have it run the first time. Um, the odds that that works even for like a very experienced programmer for like a complicated question, don't make it worth it. It's better to just um, you know, debug as you go. This is great advice. I think people are really gonna find this super valuable. Would you say that the same holds true in that you can practice coding interviews with friends in this way? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, so I think it's actually uh, a really good uh, system because I think that there's some value that you can get from being presented with a question live and having to deal with it live. I think there's a different type of value you can get from studying a question and like doing it on your own time and kind of like looking up things and, and researching it. And if you're practicing with someone and you each study a question and then you ask it to the other person, you kind of get both sides of that and you get to practice asking a question and you get to look at another like, you know, fake candidate and see what it feels like to observe somebody in an interview. So I, I think that's a really valuable exercise. I think that's something that uh, it's great for students to pair up and do together. There's also websites that uh, just match people. Um, I think that I used one years ago. I don't know if it's still around called PRAMP, um, mm -hmm. which is practice makes perfect it's like an acronym and it was like you could just find other people who want to go on a video call and, and ask each other a coding question mm -hmm. so that's great uh, yeah i never heard of that but that's a really awesome resource to practice yeah. so so there's really you really don't have any excuse not to practice live coding uh yeah i think it's it's definitely uh <laughs> definitely a very good use of your time you you don't want the first time you're you're doing that to be like when you're in an interview and that that process that you shared mm -hmm. uh, is that something that you learned elsewhere, or 
just kind of refined over time? Um, I think that's like a couple, like just like best practices that I have kind of like compiled into a methodology. I've mm -hmm. tried to come up with like a good like acronym for it, mm -hmm. but I can't think of anything like super catchy or like that is a real word. Mm -hmm. But my like system is like clarify, get examples, discuss the question, implement the question. And then after that, so, you know, some people care a lot about uh, like big O and, and time complexity. Uh, mm -hmm. Discuss that at the end when you're when you're done implementing. Mm -hmm. So those are my like five steps, but I haven't come up with a good acronym for it. Yeah. So maybe if I do, I'll, I'll trademark it or something. Okay. Yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. Uh, what about when it comes time to ask the candidate if they have questions for you? Is that something you ask? Uh, yeah, I uh, always like it when candidates have have questions. Um, Why do you like it? Because it shows that they're they're enthusiastic and interested, and it it shows that they they care about their job. Um, I want a candidate who's like wants a good job, who wants to like feel happy with their work, mm -hmm. and uh, I like it when candidates ask questions, especially about like um like our engineering organization, mm -hmm. um like. I would love to have a candidate who is interested in whether or not we have tests because I want a candidate who's going to be advocating for testing and going to be like beating their drum about that. Mm -hmm. um, so if a candidate is concerned that they're walking into a company that doesn't have a good testing infrastructure, that's a candidate who has like similar values to me that I, I want to, uh, I want to hire that person because they're going to proliferate those values and, and, you know, uh, write a bunch of tests and, try to force other people to write tests just as an example um yeah, that's a great so, example. yeah so um yeah and it, so i i just i like to see that and i i like to see people who are like uh ambitious and like interested in like a particular thing and then like kind of like showing that enthusiasm like yeah i'm like i'm really interested in working at a company where i can learn this this technology like i'm really interested in somewhere where i can like collaborate a lot or like whatever it might be um, so, so you don't hold it against a candidate if they're coming to you and they're saying they want to learn something that they don't currently know? Oh, no, that, that's definitely a plus. Um, I think, you know, it is a job. There, there, there's a fundamental need to have somebody who can be a productive contributor. But this is a field where constant learning is uh, basically a requirement. Uh, you, can, you can't learn everything that you need for a software role in any class. You can learn enough to be effective and then you can learn how to learn and then you know anytime you get a ticket there's going to be something in that ticket you haven't ever done before or you don't remember how to do so it's really about like uh pro learning the process of acquiring information and, and synthesizing it really quickly mm -hmm. um so somebody who's passionate about learning or excited about learning something new that's a pretty good indicator to me that they're going to be effective because they're going to pick up new stuff um and there's no way I could hire somebody who knows everything that we use. Like every, it's just same for any company. It's just, you know, every company has like slightly different tools they use for different parts of their stack. So mm -hmm. I, I definitely within reason, I want to hire a learner. You know, mm -hmm. obviously again, you need somebody who can get up to speed in a reasonable amount of time, but yeah. Uh, this is a question I had just today from one of our boot camp students. And I'd like to hear your, how you would handle it. The question was, I'm seeing a lot of jobs that list Python as one of the skills required, mm -hmm. but we don't teach Python in the boot camp. Mm -hmm. And he said, "Should I go? Should I start go uh, go off on my own and start try to learn Python mm -hmm. in addition to JavaScript?" Yeah, that's what a good question. Think? So, first of all, Perminio Tech teaches two of the three most popular languages, so I, I think students are getting pretty good exposure to a wide breadth of the industry. Uh, mm -hmm. My company, we only use JavaScript with React and, and Java, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but Python is the, the third of the, the three most popular. Um, I think, uh, so there's a concept of a, I think people call it like a T-shaped engineer, um, which essentially just means like specialize deeply in one area, but be enough of a generalist to be effective in other areas. I think that's a good principle to apply to a software career. Mm -hmm. um, I think that especially as you advance, you should have really, really thorough, comprehensive expertise in one domain, but yeah. definitely not be afraid of picking up things in other domains. And mm -hmm. I think for a beginner, uh, you could say the same at kind of like a smaller scale. Um, I think 
beginners should be a lot more concerned with going too wide. And I think it happens a lot. Uh, I've seen people like, I need to learn Angular and React and Postgres, and I need to learn Mongo, and I need to learn five different backend frameworks. And then they get like a shallow exposure to all of those. Um, I think what you should do as a beginner is focus on learning skills that let you make things that you're proud of, that you can brag about. And because that's ultimately like, if you're getting an entry level job, they're not hiring you because you're an expert in whatever technology, otherwise it wouldn't be an entry level job. Mm -hmm. But you, if you have a portfolio that shows you've actually made software, uh, you know, that speaks a lot. So I, I think uh, most companies are not particularly concerned with whether someone knows their framework. Mm -hmm. um, they're more concerned with, especially at the entry level, like wh whether someone has those skills. So I would say if you're entry level, pick a particular technology that is widespread. So probably like it involves learning JavaScript or Java or Python, and then go very deep on that technology, touch other things occasionally, get familiar with them. But, you know, for the beginning, like really focus on one thing. That, that's my advice. Um, one, one caveat to that, I would say, um, generally very small companies like startups are interested in hiring somebody who can be effective day one. Mm -hmm. Um, a, a, the larger a company is the more they can invest in training and ramp up. But if you're want to join a startup with two employees, um, that company's probably going to need you to, you know, they have a, you know, small runway. They, they need you to start working right away. Mm -hmm. Um, that said, I, I don't think a company like that is the best place for a beginner. I, I think uh, you can get a lot more learning at a, a company that can invest in training you. Mm -hmm. But everyone's different. I'm not saying that's that's categorically true. You I've know. heard the same from other hiring managers who worked at different size companies. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that, that's a really good point. Consider the size of the company. Yeah. Uh, bigger companies have Slack in the system that they can train and bring newbies up to speed a little bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Some of them have even like dedicated training programs, mm -hmm. you know, some of them, even, even for weeks when you come in, you're, you're just focused on training. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Great. Uh, what other tips, any other tips or suggestions you want to share in this session? Oh, uh, that's an open-ended question. Um, I would say, so I think I, I talked about a lot of my like major points, which are like organized approach to answering questions, doing a lot of like deliberate preparation and the, the networking thing is a, a big opinion of mine. Uh, those are my main big things. I have a lot of like particular opinions about uh, like data structure and algorithm questions, mm -hmm. but yeah, I don't know. That's a bit too open-ended. I think I'm not sure. Um, well, well, maybe maybe we can uh, meet again and come up with a more specific agenda if you want to go deep into, let's say, algorithms and data yeah, structures. I I would love to. I I uh, similar maybe. to hiring in general. Like I'm one of these weird people who like loves lead code. I know a lot of people really hate it, but I I'm always happy to talk about that kind of thing. Maybe what would be fun is if we could actually do a mock live interview where yeah. you interview someone and talk through it and then maybe kind of give a give a recap at the end of yeah. what, what went well or so yeah. so so if you're listening so let's just say if you are listening to this now and you're a student boot camp student and you're interested in perhaps uh volunteering to do a live mock interview with Evan who's done over hundreds of interviews uh, shoot either of us a message on Slack and we will try to make that happen. Yeah, I, I would love to do that. That sounds fun. Yeah, okay, that'd be really fun. Hopefully some good good practice too. Yeah, fun and good practice. Yeah. Well, this has been awesome. I really enjoyed you uh, taking the time to have this conversation and I look forward to doing the live interview with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Brendan. I'm always always happy to talk about this stuff. Thanks, Evan. Take care. Bye. Bye.